Well, one of the, the things that I see in my classroom is, is I have a lot of students, they, they say there's, you know, there's so much stuff out there on the internet. There's, there's all these things. You know, how do we know what's actually true? It's not easy to know what truth is. I'll tell you one, one instant thing is if it's contrary to the Word of God, it's not true. So there are many theories out there that people will teach as fact that, that are not fact. Facts remain. Fact, and, and I've never seen the Bible uh, uh, teach anything that was against a scientific fact. Right. I've seen, I've seen uh, uh, theories contest, or I don't understand the Bible, which happens all the time for right. me. All the, the things that come at us on the internet, uh, uh, even, it's not even just the internet, it's even in the, in the scientific literature. Yeah, it's, it's hard to know what the truth is. And uh, if you really want to get into a subject, it's a lot of work. And a lot of times we don't have the expertise to vet it. And that happens to me too. So it's not just the students. So what I do is if, if it's contrary to the Word of God, if it's contrary to the Scriptures, then, then I, I know that either I'm misunderstanding the Scriptures <clears throat> or what, what's being taught here is not right. But I don't have a simple answer for you on that because I even see it in the chemical literature. And so what you see is you see data. You can look at data and, and you can critique the data if you're, if you're proficient in the field. One of the things that I've, I've seen, you know, in the media and things like that, well, do you believe the science? No, I don't believe any science, but I can assess the data. And I think because uh, we have this glut of information that we've become lazy intellectually at, to some level, at least many of us have in our society, and we just believe it because it's out there. And, you know, what are your views on how we can more effectively, I don't know, be more skeptical about what's, what's being presented as true? Well, if the media says believe the science, I immediately am quite skeptical. <laughs> yes. Really, really, because right. the person saying that doesn't understand the science. It's like I told you, the real science is very difficult to right. understand. If you want to look at medical sciences, that's especially difficult. Uh, uh, epidemiology, looking at things and trends o over a human beings' lifetime, it's very hard to know long-term effects, for example. Right. Because people are living 70, 80, 90 years, so it's very hard to make an assessment, very hard to know what caused that sickness. Is that from something that, 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 that happened you know, 20 years ago? Very hard to know. We just don't have the analytical tools to make that judgment. That's one of the first things I, I do when I evaluate an article is you know, I, I try to figure out where did most of the funding come from, especially if, if there's monetary potential. Uh, have you seen that? that oh, absolutely, all the time, all the time. You know, I've been critiquing Origin of Life for quite some time. Right. And uh, uh, it's not just follow the money. Yeah, these people are getting certain grants from certain foundations that, uh, but then also it's careers, it's reputations. I mean, for 40 oh, right. years they've been right. teaching something and now all of a sudden somebody comes and says, no, I'm not sure you interpreted that data correctly. That data could just as well be saying the opposite of what you're saying, that, that uh, life definitely didn't happen that way. Well, you brought up the, the origin of life stuff, and like you, I'm a chemist, I'm an analytical chemist, but for me, uh, as a Christian, like you, I, I looked at you know, this, this, the Bible says that God created life. And so when I heard the idea of you know, life happened accidentally, um, I went back to math class and I thought, you know, let's just look at this from a really basic point of view. The statistics don't add up. And you've obviously done much, much more on this than myself, but you know, matter does not self-organize without substantial energy input. When God, when it, when it says God, in six days, God created the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, he doesn't give us a whole lot of details on how he did that. He spoke life into existence, but how exactly did the molecules come together? Did, did, did atoms form molecules, molecules form higher? Some, he doesn't give us the details. So scientists want to go and investigate things, and you can be investigating the origin of life and still be a, an ardent believer in the scriptures, right. because you're looking for details that God never revealed to us in the scriptures, but he put science before us to begin to, to understand, okay, that's how you did it. And it wasn't until the 1950s when they discovered that all of this is written in the DNA, in the genome, in the structure of the DNA, and it codes for the proteins, 
which are nature's nanomachines which construct our bodies. If you do not believe in the physical resurrection of Jesus Christ, send me an email, tour at drjamestour.org, and we will get together, and I will share with you about why I embrace the resurrection of Jesus. Prior to the 1950s, we didn't know how God did this. So a person may say, oh, well, you know, it's just a miracle. Well, it, and it, it is miraculous that this thing is there, but there's an explanation for that happening. And uh, uh, so he gives us, through the sciences, he gives us understanding. And this is a good thing, because now that we understand DNA and we understand its structure, and when I look at the data on origin of life, it screams out to me that the way you are proposing is not the way it happened. But more fundamentally is this. We can take a cell, and you can deconstruct a cell. You can take, get the lipids out, you can get the proteins out, you, you can get the, the DNA, the RNA, you can get the small molecules. You can put those in discrete bottles. Give them to any group of scientists anywhere in the world and say, I give you all these discrete bottles, this is just a deconstructed cell, put the cell back together for me, will you? Because <laughs> somehow on an early earth this came together. They say, well, cells used to be much simpler back then. Okay, biophysicists have computed the simplest of cells. What kind of cell could you have? How simple could it be and still have life? You have about a dozen different subsystems that need to be in place. Right. And then you have all the, the, the non-covalent interactions that are needed, which is an enormous amount of things. Non-covalently, how to have things aligned. Nobody knows how that, that does it. In a single yeast cell, you have 10 to the 79 billion protein-protein non-covalent interactions. 10 to the 79 billion, the, the number of particles in the <coughs> universe is 10 to the 90. This is 10 to the 79 billion. So, so that's not going to happen. So nobody can reconstruct a cell. So how in your little pond would all this happen even if you had all the molecules? What is the difference in difficulty in, say, making a hemoglobin protein versus making a polymer down at the chemical plant? Most of the polymers that ExxonMobil makes are, are uh, uh, vinyl polymers. Yes. They make some condensation polymers, but most of them are vinyl polymers. All of the, the ones in nature are, are condensation polymers. Mm -hmm. And so the delta G, the free energy, is positive, right. which means that the reaction is unfavored. It's, it's favored not to go. It does not want to go in the polymerization direction. So actually it favors the starting material. So if you just leave these things, you get mostly starting material and very little product. The product that you get is very short. You don't get the polymers. The other thing about nature's polymers is that they're ordered. They have high order. So there's this highly ordered system of it's not just the same A, 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 A over and over again, or A, B, A, B. Right. It's a discrete pattern that codes for certain things. So in DNA, it codes for what it's going to translate to the RNA. For the RNA, it codes for what it's going to translate to the protein. In the protein, it's for what job it can specifically do, what chemical reaction. So there is information embedded in every one of these polymers. Right. You don't have that same kind of information in ExxonMobil's polymers. You might have what's called Shannon information if you had a random polymer, which is, which is what kind of packets of information can you pull out of randomness. But all of life is what's called specified information. And these are not terms that were coined by, by people at the Discovery Institute. These terms were actually coined by people working in information theory. You have this specified information. Nobody knows where the code came from. So not only can you not make the polymers because the free energy is against you, you don't know how you got the code to arrange these. So it has to have a particular code, a particular information. So all of the polymers have some embedded code in them. Nobody knows how to polymerize these things. So the other thing is, the polymers don't last. So if you say a peptide bond lasts seven years in water, mm. and uh, just, just, just an amide bond, so you have your peptide bond, will last seven years in water. Well then, if you had, if you had a 300 mer, because now you have a polymer, right. so then it's seven years divided by 300, so you got about 13 hours. Before something breaks. Yes, so before you lost your polymer. If you're talking about RNA, to code for that 300 mer of protein, you need 600 unit RNA, minimally, 600 RNAs. 600 RNAs with a half-life of RNA of about 100 days in water, that means you have a couple of hours, 
three or four hours for that RNA. So if somehow, all of a sudden, RNA formed that had the right code, it's got three or four hours to get rid of all the other nucleotides that were floating around and introduce all 20 amino acids and code for them. Where did all the 20 amino acids come from? With the associated enzymes to have the amino acids line up, and it's got four hours, right. and it's dead. And when you're talking about, about uh, uh, geological time frames for origin of life, you're not talking about hours anymore. No, we're talking about millions and billions, billions of years. Billions of years, and so, so time becomes the enemy because time is the destructive force. And the time doesn't have to be long. We're talking mm. about hours to days. So, so time is actually the enemy, not the friend. Time is, is the enemy when it comes to organic chemistry. You take a graduate student working in the lab that doesn't want to work up that reaction, say, oh, I'll come back to tomorrow and work it up. Oh, they take a huge yield hit. It falls apart. So when that reaction is optimized, you've got to stop that reaction. So time is actually the enemy. The Bible says that the creation cries out to the glory of God. And that's, I think, about as much as we understand on, on how it could have happened. Yeah, yeah. One day we might, you know, as scientists, we can never say we will never know. We can't, we can't say that. So I still hold out that one day we might know. I just say, as far as right now, we don't know. And that solution is not on the near horizon. Right. And we know that because we can track progress towards solving the construction of a cell. And because every year we learn more about the complexity of a cell, the target moves further away from us. The cell hasn't changed, but we learn more about its complexity. Mm. So we might have moved up a little bit, but this has moved further away from us. The more we faster. learn, the more complicated it gets. The more complicated it gets. That's, that's the way you can track progress toward a target. You look at how much closer you are to the target. And you do that in all sorts of technical fields. Right. How far am I away from this? How much closer am I? And every year we're getting further away. That tells us we're not even near the right location. If you're enjoying this series, give us a thumbs up and click the subscribe button, and that way you'll hear when we're coming out with new videos. There are no salaried employees in this organization. All the accounting, all the legal work, that's all done by friends of mine. The only thing that I have to pay for is the production work, and if you could help us out with that, I'd appreciate it. There's a link below where you can just click on that and help us in several different ways. Thank you.